Hello, and thank you for listening to my talk. I'm Carl Reining, and my talk is Modeling for Interpreting the Effects of Thin Beds on Inverted Elastic Properties. And when we're talking about thin beds and inversion in this context, uh, we're not talking about using inversion to better resolve thin beds that, say, a conventional stack wasn't able to look at. Inversion does do a good job of helping us with our resolution. If we look at our wedge model here as an example, as we move from the thickest well-resolved part into uh, the portion where the side lobes are starting to interfere with the main events, the timing on our conventional stack starts to become no longer proportional to the thickness of the wedge. And as we get thinner, uh, the timing actually becomes constant and only the amplitudes are changing. Inversion helps us with both those scenarios. If we have a, a good robust wavelet estimate, uh, it can remove the effect of the side load interference and it can give us the response that we'd expect in that zone. What we're actually interested in today though is the, the areas below that thickness. So very thin layers that are not resolvable by the inversion, by seismic stack, but that still have an effect on the amplitude. And that's important because the thin beds, even though we can't see them individually, they will have an effect on the bulk response and the elastic properties that we measure. And so we want to know, given those measured elastic properties, can we back out what the properties of those thin layers are in terms of their proportions, in terms of their geology? And what we're going to do is use rock physics modeling to drive that uh, interpretation. So this is basically what we're looking at. When we have you know, two very well resolved layers, uh, the actual elastic properties in black are the same as what we'd observe from seismic in red. As we start to introduce thin layers with different impedances, we aren't able to resolve those on the seismic, even though they are there. And the effect that those have is a, is a bulk shift of those properties. We have an average effect measured by the seismic wave. The more, the higher proportion that we have of those layers, the higher the impact is on that shift. And so that's the first thing we're gonna look at is given the magnitude of that shift, can we determine what the proportion of those uh, inserted layers is? Now, not only the proportion is important, but also the properties of those layers. So if we're inserting high porosity sand, for example, into a shale versus a low porosity sand into a shale, that's going to have a different effect on uh, how much we're seeing in that shift. And so that's going to be the second thing we're going to look at is not only the proportions, but the properties of those inserted layers. Can we interpret both of those from our model? And we're going to do that in three steps. First step is we're going to model the reservoir component. That's going to use our, our standard rock physics modeling. It's going to include all of our variable component, whether that's porosity, lithology, fluid content. The second step is we're going to model the non-reservoir component. That's going to be our static component. Shale is a very common example. Third step is we're going to mix those two at different proportions, all the way from 100% reservoir to 100% shale. And we're going to organize those into a template where we can interpret the observed seismic response of the elastic properties. All of this process follows uh, the process laid out by Avseth et al. in their leading edge paper. And I think we have four really good examples of how you can put that into practice here. The first example uh, that we're going to look at is from the Doba Basin in Chad. And we have a number of highly interbedded sands and shales uh, in the reservoir section. And you can see over on the two examples I've given, uh, our logs all tend to go from sand to shale to sand to shale back and forth. We have some sections that are blockier, you know, more continuous reservoir than others, uh, and others that are very highly interbedded. And what we want to do from the seismic data is see if we can determine the difference between these different zones and find more of these uh, continuous sand layers. <clears throat> the sands and the shales have very distinct elastic properties. And if we look at a, a histogram of P impedance, for example, colored by V shale, you can see that the reservoir points have a distinctly different P impedance compared to the shale points, similarly with the VPVS ratio. The question is when we go to the seismic, are we going to see the similar effects when we reduce our resolution? Uh, so to test that out, we can upscale our logs uh, to the seismic scale. And what we see is, no, we, we don't have this, this you know, uh, bimodal distribution anymore. We kind of bring everything into more of a, a centralized distribution. And that brings up the question, well, what do the bulk properties indicate? When we observe uh, impedances at this scale, can we make inferences about 
what the uh, relative proportions of the sand and shale are. So the first step is we're going to model the reservoir component. And for that, we're going to use rock physics modeling for, for the, the sand component. <clears throat> for that, we input our mineral and fluid values. Uh, we have a theoretical model for our rock frame. And once we, we build that up, we're going to calibrate that with the well data. And that's what we're showing over here. So this is the predicted P wave velocity uh, from the well calibrated uh, against the well data uh, itself. When we have our model, we can vary that, uh, that model's porosity or some other geological factor, mineralogy, fluid saturation. In this case, we're interested in varying the porosity. And so we've already done that here. Uh, you know, we have our P wave predicted at a number of different porosities. Uh, and we don't have to do any other variations for that. The second step is to model the non-reservoir component. Um, that's going to be our static component. It's going to be unchanging the shales. Um, there's no significant variation in, in the shale porosity or fluid saturation, for example. For the shale properties, we're going to use empirical observations. The modeling of the shale is a little bit more difficult. Uh, it doesn't have a, a good porosity range to do the model calibration. Uh, the model specific shale require a little bit more information. So we're going to use the, the log data itself. And to do that, we'll look at a distribution of the, the P wave, S wave, and density points from the logs where the V shale equals to one. Uh, and from that, we're going to pick representative values of the velocities and densities from these distributions. The third step, now we have our reservoir model, we have our non-reservoir properties is to mix them together and calculate the average effect. So we'll do that for each of the reservoir models uh, with varying amounts of shale. We'll start with the, the highly porous uh, reservoir. We'll mix in more and more shale until we get to 100% shale. We'll repeat that with medium porosity. We'll repeat that with low porosity, each time going from 100% reservoir to 100% shale. <clears throat> and you can see over on the right, I've organized that uh, into a template. This is a VPVS versus P impedance cross plot. Lines of constant net to gross are shown in green, so 100% net to gross, 100% reservoir at the bottom, 0% net to gross at the top. And you can see all the points converge to uh, that shale point uh, at the top there. The blue lines are constant porosity, going from 0% uh, reservoir porosity to 39% reservoir porosity in the blue lines. And you can see, again, when we filter to just the, our reservoir points on the well data, uh, the porosity trend there follows what we see in our porosity model. And that's what we're going for, is at these higher net to gross uh, intervals, can we further interpret the, uh, the present, further interpret the properties of the, the reservoir rock itself in terms of porosity in this case? So the application, as I mentioned before, for this one is we want to apply it to our seismic data. We want to, to impose this uh, model on as an interpretation. You can see when we do our interpretation, we have thicker sand zones that are very well resolved by the inversion, uh, and we match the well logs quite nicely. And we have other zones where we have high levels of interbedding, and our seismic response is kind of an average of that. We aren't able to individually resolve each of these beds. And so that, that's the shift that we're looking for is, you know, from these sand or shale values to what are seismic measures, can that tell us something about the net to gross? So we take our template from before, we put our, apply that to our seismic data, and we put on a number of different uh, classifications here. So ranging from our lowest net to gross in the greens to our highest net to gross in the yellows. And then for the high net to gross, we further subdivide that by the porosity of the reservoir rock that's put in, low porosity, medium porosity, high porosity. And you can see when we compare it to our uh, V shale logs, everywhere where we had high V shale, we're, we're seeing low net to gross values. Everywhere we see low V shale, we're seeing high net to gross values. And then that high net to gross also varies in porosity throughout the reservoir. Uh, which we can then use to map and plan our reservoir development. Okay, so that example we looked at interbedded sands and shales. The second scenario we're going to consider is when we have a thin reservoir and a background shale. And for this example, we'll look at uh, an example from Colombia, where we have thin sandstone reservoirs within a fairly homogeneous background. Um, all of these reservoirs are below seismic resolution. 
Um, there's variations of porosity within them. And we want to find within, again, within the seismic data, where is the thickest and high, most highly porous uh, portions of these sands. You can see our background again is fairly constant. We have a little bit of a shale layer in the middle here, but you know, around these uh, sand reservoirs, uh, you know, our background properties again are, are quite consistent. Last time we looked at uh, you know taking uh, multiple layers of the different the reservoir and non-reservoir properties. This time we're looking at just changing the thickness of the reservoir, and in principle it's the same. We we don't have any inherent geometrical information about the uh, layers when we do the averaging. Uh, so we, we can do this just as the same way we did the previous example. So again, we start by modeling both the reservoir and non-reservoir components. You can see here the, uh, the reservoir component matched against the well data. Our non-reservoir background, we've extracted that again from the distribution of points from the logs. And then we calculate our average effect again. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a cross plot of lambda over mu versus lambda rho. Again, our constant net to gross lines in green, so 100% reservoir down here, uh, working our way up to 100% shale at our converging point here. We've run this set of uh, models for every mineralogical composition of sand. We're just showing one of them here. And again, at different porosities from 5% to 35% porosity. When we go to create the template, what we want to do is find attributes that have independent behavior for what we're trying to look at. And so this is an example for each of the, um, the net to gross ratios, uh, showing how lambda over mu does a great job of distinguishing between those different cases, uh, but not being very responsive to porosity. Uh, whereas in this case, lambda rho is very responsive to porosity. So combining those two attributes allows us to fairly independently map those two parameters. So we've upscaled the logs, and that's the, the colored points that you see on the template here, <clears throat> just to show the effect again of seismic resolution. And we can go back to the logs and interpret what we would have uh, interpreted from, from the log data. So in the top one here, we have a net to gross ratio of 0.5, in the middle, a zero, and the bottom, 0.2. And both of the, uh, the sand uh, components are about 25% porosity. When you put those log interpretations on the upscaled seismic points with our, our template interpretation, uh, you can see, especially for the, the upper layer, the higher net to gross layer, we've come very close to what we would have predicted from the template. Uh, so about 50% uh, net to gross, somewhere between 20 and 25% porosity. The lower net to gross is showing on the lower net to gross portion of the template as expected. A uh, little bit more discrepancy between those two points. But again, relatively speaking, we've done a good job of uh, matching both our model response with our log response. So we can apply this to the seismic again, uh, starting with net to gross, low net to gross in green, high in yellow. And you can see now as we move away from the wells, trying to predict what we might be encountering, uh, we have this large reservoir wedge here coming up onto a structure. And as we get higher on the structure, the wedge thins out and we start to get lower and lower net to gross ratios. Now we can also subdivide our, our best uh, sands, our highest net to gross based on porosity. And we can see that, yeah, as, as you know, we look at these thicker sections, there are variations in the porosity as well that we can use for reservoir development. So another, keeping with that scenario, we still have a thin reservoir in a background shale, but we're gonna look at a different example uh, from Australia in the Otway Basin. Here we have a number of uh, both thin and thick sands in, in a background shale again. But our objective here is to figure out what thickness of sand is necessary to distinguish the presence of gas. We have water saturated gases, uh, sorry, water saturated reservoir, we have gas saturated reservoir. And if our reservoir is below seismic resolution, we wanna know, are we still able to detect the presence of that gas? So you can see on this example where we have uh, both the top and, and bottom sands are quite thick. It's really this uh, central one that we're, we're more interested in, uh, you know, that level of thickness. We're gonna model the, the reservoir component the same way as we've done in the previous examples, rock physics modeling. Our background component, we're gonna be a little bit more conservative. Uh, I've, I've just displayed a, a cross plot of EPVSP impedance of only the background shales. 
And rather than choose some properties in, in the center of that distribution, we're going to shift that to be a little closer to where the, the reservoir points would be, just so that we've, we've decreased the variation uh, that we're expecting to see so that uh, we're a little bit more conservative with our predictions. Again, looking at the upscaling the logs and plotting those points, um, colored by depth in this case, <clears throat> we can go to the logs and interpret what our net to gross would have been based on the V-shale, interpret what our porosity would have been, and compare that with how things are fitting uh, on, on the template. And you can see, especially for this upper layer, uh, we we're incredibly close with you know, both our model predictions and our interpretation from the logs. Our higher net to gross is showing on the higher net to gross portion of the template. A um, little bit larger shift, but still very consistent with the interpretation. But what we were interested in is how big is the shift because of gas saturation? So now I'm, I'm displaying two templates there. Uh, first template, the darker one is for water saturated uh, reservoir component. The lighter one is for the gas saturated component. And how much our observed response is going to change depends not only on the, uh, the net to gross ratio, but also on the porosity. So for example, starting with net to gross, if we look at the change in water to gas at 100% net to gross, that's a much, big, much bigger change uh, than if we were at 10% net to gross of the observed seismic response. Similarly, if we look at you know, a 5% porosity reservoir as opposed to a 30% porosity reservoir, that's a much smaller shift. And so we have to consider both of those when we're evaluating, can we detect these fluid changes? So this is a plot of our different model components expressed as a fractional difference of P impedance on the y-axis versus a change in gas saturation. So this is our wet case up here and 100% gas over here. We've done that for both a regular saturation and a patchy saturation model. Patchy saturation is going to be our, our worst case scenario here. <clears throat> in terms of the seismic inversion, we can make some assumptions. So if, if we can say that above a 10% change uh, in properties, that's a fairly robust response. We're likely to, to be able to attribute that to geology as opposed to noise within the inversion. So for example, at 100% uh, sand, that's a very robust response. We're definitely going to be able to see the difference between that and water. As we sh lower our net to gross down to about 50%, we're still very much able to distinguish between gas and water. Uh, but as we get into 40, 30, 20% net to gross, we start to get into that uncertain zone, perhaps. Similarly, if we uh, were to decrease our gas saturation, if we weren't fully gas saturated, maybe we we're only at 50%, 50% and 50% net to gross uh, starts to push us into that uncertain zone. That's for a high porosity reservoir. If we lower our porosity, all those points shift up. And really now we have to consider, are we... What, what's the quality of our seismic and are we going to be able to uh, see some of these things? So again, uh, full sandstone reservoir, full gas saturation, we'll very likely be able to distinguish the difference between that and a water saturated uh, reservoir. But as we get you know, 50% net to gross in that low porosity case, it's very unlikely that we're over that noise threshold in the inversion to be able to detect that. And so we can use this to judge, is it worth shooting seismic? Is it worth doing an inversion uh, for this particular objective? The final scenario we're gonna look at, we're gonna kind of flip things around. So before we've looked at a you know, constant background with a thin reservoir. This time we're going to look at a larger reservoir with thin disruptions within. So this example comes from the Cooper Basin in Australia. Uh, we have a fairly thick reservoir interval, uh, but we have a number of non-prospective coal layers within that. We have some, some zones that have quite a high number of coals, others where we have fewer coals, and we want to distinguish you know, between these two zones as we plan field development. Coal measurements are a little bit problematic when it comes to the, the shear velocity. Um, coals are both low velocity and dispersive, which cause issues with the shear log. So we're going to do a little bit of adjustment to our, our modeling approach. The reservoir component, same thing as before. We're going to build a rock physics model, uh, match that to our, our well data. Uh, 
<clears throat> for the static coal properties, the P wave and uh, density values, we can get those from our logs. Those are consistent with what we see in, in you know, coal, published coal properties. Uh, but when we look at our S wave velocity, if we were to take a, a representative value just from the log data, that would give us a very low VPVS ratio, only 1.2, and it'd be much higher than uh, other observed measurements of shear wave velocities in coal. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take a VPVS relationship uh, derived from lab data. We're going to use our observed P wave velocity with that VPVS relationship to calculate a, a VS, uh, which is 1300 meters per second. It's actually outside of our distribution, but it should be more consistent when we get to the seismic data, which is really where we want to apply this model. So again, we've expressed uh, that model now in terms of a, a net to gross template, uh, where the green lines are constant net to gross, 100% up at the top here, going down to lower net to gross. I haven't gone all the way to 100% coal because it's unlikely that we'll see a large block of coal like that. So we're at 60% net to gross down here. And again, varying in porosity from, from 2% to 25% for the reservoir component. Now I've, I've also taken and upscaled these logs and then interpreted uh, sort of a cutoff between our high net to gross and low net to gross. And when we apply that to our log data, uh, we can see that we, we do get a consistent interpretation that down here where we have more coals, we're getting a lower net to gross. We've actually identified this little shale layer as lower net to gross within the, the sand here. Uh, but otherwise, the sands above and below this zone are showing as more continuous, which is what we would expect as well. So the main point I want to get across is that the usefulness of seismic isn't limited by its ability to resolve beds. Just because we can't see and resolve and you know clearly identify the properties of a, an individual thin bed doesn't mean that we can't still infer information about the presence of those beds and about their properties. The average effect that those unresolvable layers have on the total seismic response are still very useful information. To get that information, we need to use rock physics modeling of the different components, the reservoir component, the non-reservoir component, and we're going to make sure that that's specific to the problem at hand, whether it's coal, shale, uh, reservoir, non-reservoir. And then when we build these templates, that helps us bridge that scale gap between what we get from seismic and what we're hoping to understand uh, when we see things on logs as well. I'd very much like to thank Bridgeport and Bengal for letting us show uh, some of the data examples, as well as some other anonymous companies. And I'd like to thank you for your attention as well.